far in the north, there's a land called Alaska, where heaven beckons mountains, which sunrise turns to gold, where dawn's arrival floods with light, a landscape big and bold. Our story is about a narrow strip of this vast land, occupied partly from the north to south by a pipeline and animals. Animals. All kinds of animals. Animals large and animals small. Animals short and animals tall. Animals some of us never have seen. Some of them gentle, some of them mean. Well, uh, sometimes mean. These wild creatures were here long before the works of man, like the Trans-Alaska Pipeline, which extends 800 miles from Prudhoe Bay to Valdez. Their ancestors were here before man himself. But the wild creatures remain, living animals' lives as animals do, from centuries past, from season to season. And that is how we shall see them, against a background of changing seasons. From the beginning, the season that means beginning, spring, whose higher sun now softens the remaining snows of winter and calls back those winged harbingers, those heralds of the cycle's re-beginning waterfowl. Some perhaps a bit too anxious, others content, once having arrived, to rest from a long journey. For the caribou, spring has brought a change of winter coats, a lighter one for the warmer temperatures to come. For caribou, too, are moving north with the sun toward summer calving grounds. The cows first, the bulls will follow later. They gather in herds and maintain a respectful distance from any suspicious characters in the neighborhood, like this one. But for the grizzly bear, too, the change to spring is related to food. In the winter, she sleeps. In the summer and fall, she feeds on berries, fish, and other prey. But in spring, awake and restless and hungry, she takes what nature offers, munching on the first spring blades of grass and the tender shoots of other plants. And when she tires of her salad diet, resting lazily in the springtime sun, this tough survivor of the Arctic winter knows the grizzly may flush out a tidbit just right for a hungry raven. It's certainly worth checking into, carefully checking into. The raven understands his survival depends not only on investigating every possibility of food, but on not becoming food himself. Still, the bear knows the raven is just a crow with an inflated ego. <laughs> and who wants to eat crow anyway? These rocky Arctic slopes appear lifeless, even incapable of supporting life. But dull sheep cling to these mountainsides and find a living here. For the sheep, the changes of spring bring a new zest to life in the high meadows. The ewes and yearlings find better feeding on the lower slopes. But the rams stay high up, apart from the rest of the herd, aloof and elusive. Sheep prefer to stay near the rocky cliffs and outcroppings because they can easily outmaneuver any predator in this rugged terrain. These lambs test their growing strength. They could be described as literally headstrong.
The years have washed over these mountains as numerous as raindrops from a summer shower. But life here in the high Arctic remains unchanged. In the spruce forest to the south, spring changes come more quickly now. Like the rapidly changing flight of the bird of prey, or the flock of phalaropes, the land too is constantly changing. The land now shows the face of summer. But this is a face only a mother could love, and she thinks it's splendid. Big ears to hear a stealthy tread. Big eyes perceiving risk ahead. Big nose. Well, every mother's moose should have a nose like this. The long legs are a little shaky now, but getting better with practice. The mother, having just given birth, craves salts from this natural mineral lick on the forest floor. On the highest branch, typically, a golden eagle rests before flight. He will cruise the current searching for food, a ground squirrel or other small mammal. But the eagle is a lone hunter. He is not looking for airborne company. Still, he finds it. His noisy neighbors, irate at this invasion of their airspace, join him for the animal world's version of an aerial dogfight. Because they are smaller and more maneuverable, the ravens are safe. But should one of them come within the range of the eagle's talons when he rolls over on his back, it would be for that raven nevermore. But turnabout is fair play. This raven, on his own solo flight, passes through the territory of a pair of nesting Jaegers and gets the same treatment given the eagle. Having learned, perhaps, from the eagle, he responds in the same way. And then reports his encounter to the neighborhood council. Perhaps the raven version of a council of war. They did. Just wait till we get those Jaegers. Well, perhaps there's more bluster than bite among these characters. This grizzly like the eagle, is looking for a ground squirrel. She is well into summer feeding, and life is just one continuous meal from sunup to sundown. So the scent of a ground squirrel is more than she, well, more than she can bear. Even if she catches the squirrel, though, she may use up more calories than she takes in if she continues to expend energy at this rate. But bears must work to live and often travel great distances in search of food.
They rarely pause to rest. Well, not very often. But maybe this is just an after-dinner break to uh, pick those enormous teeth with an even more enormous toothpick, a cast-off caribou antler. And to just stretch out and scratch. But one itch is never satisfied in these big beers. Hunger. This time, a marmot is the intended main course. With incredible power, the grizzly changes the landscape to drive out his prey, thrusting aside 50-pound stones. But he has an insatiable craving for this protein after his spring diet of grassy salads. While the bear digs, the marmot exits through the back door of his underground house. Boy, look at that guy go. Yeah, glad I got a long house. Oh, well, I'm not tired of salads. Another small animal of the tundra at two ounces is the tundra vole. He spends his entire life looking up at everything but his feet. Even the dwarf arctic flowers seem like trees to him. Other creatures look down on the vole, including the long-tailed Jaeger. Voles are the key to survival for much of the tundra community. He and his kind are constantly hunted. Foxes, eagles, owls, even bears relish this tiny little tree. This time it's the Jaeger that gets the treat. The red fox, too, carries voles to his hungry kits. But soon this will change. Soon his youngsters must learn to hunt for themselves. Caribou, perhaps like people, tend to follow the crowd. If one leads the way, the rest will follow for fear of being left behind. From the anxious one to the sluggish one. The bored one, the tired one, to the reluctant one, down to the very last one, reluctant to be left behind. They push ahead, moving on, always moving, going the way they've always gone, unless they choose to go by a different route. By late July, the herds have broken up. The caribou may appear singly, their velvet-covered antlers almost fully formed. But now other herds appear, or hordes to be more precise. Mosquitoes, black flies, and warble flies that darken the air. They torment the caribou, providing yet another incentive to keep moving. In some years, the insects may be so numerous that the caribou lose up to a quart of blood a week to their bites. Who wouldn't run for higher ground, where even a gentle breeze may offer some relief?
far to the south, near the coast of the Gulf of Alaska and the end of the pipeline, another kind of bear inhabits the lush, damp forests. There's no summer vacation for these black bear cubs. Mom has them firmly in tow, and class is definitely in session. Playing hooky is not allowed. She's an affectionate mother, and he's been an obedient little cub. Today's class is in watchfulness and caution, although the only natural predator she fears for her cubs is another bear. She carefully guides her cubs from one feeding area to the next. Come on, you guys. And they freely roam these coastal areas, including the grounds of the pipeline's marine terminal at Valdez. Another coastal mammal here is the sea otter. Even though he spends his entire life in the water, this fellow seems to feel the need of a bath. So he cleans his fur thoroughly. His coat must be kept absolutely clean. Any pollutants in the water here could coat his fur and rob him of his natural protection from the cold. When this pair has a youngster, it'll be born in the water even sleeping there, because sea otters are equipped to sleep comfortably afloat. And we thought we invented water beds. Otters feed on snails, clams, sea urchins, and crab, and they must eat as much as 25% of their weight each day to maintain their body warmth. Now summer green gives way to autumn. As new colors inflame the forest, and new sounds fill the air. The arrival of autumn signals a change for the beaver. He has been a placid observer of the hectic activities of others during the spring and summer. His own life in those seasons has involved only some minor repairs to his dams. But now he is seized with a renewed and determined vigor. With the coming of autumn, he must restock his food supply. During the winter months, he lives exclusively on the bark of branches and limbs, which he has buried in the mud near his lodge. Buried deeply enough that they won't be frozen in the ice, which will imprison him for the six months of winter. On a rocky slope overlooking the Beaver's Valley lives the pika. He may look like a small guinea pig, but he is actually a member of the rabbit family. He lives in this jumble of boulders and rocks the year round, eating any kind of vegetable matter that grows close to his protective rocks. He won't stray very far from these rocks where he was born. He doesn't hibernate. So, like the beaver, he must collect a food supply to see him through six months of survival beneath a winter mantle of snow. But winter is yet to come. Now is the time of Indian summer, that magical, quiet time before winter's arrival. But in the early dawn of this day, the quiet is broken by the harsh sounds of battle. It is still early in the season of rut for these bull moose, and the fighting is not as serious as it later will become. For each bull, these early season fights are primarily for the testing of strength. Testing, for each one, his own strength. 
as well as that of potential opponents. But when the cows are ready for mating, the fights will become vicious. Then, a bull may be injured seriously, or even killed. For now, the encounters often end by mutual consent, with little harm done. The Grey Jay ignores the commotion, unconcerned by the battles of others. In the brief warm days of Indian summer, the birds continue to make their way south, leaving predators behind. Muskox is one of the few animals in this changing land which has remained unchanged since the time of the prehistoric mastodon. He's a living link to the ancient past, and he survives now in the northernmost reaches of the Arctic, including here, where the pipeline is buried beneath his feet. The bulls are cautious and watchful. The cow trying to persuade her calf that the youngster really is on his own now. With a heavy coat that looks like a shaggy skirt, these animals are truly equipped to survive the brutal cold of the approaching Arctic winter. Now the air has grown distinctly colder, and the young moose have become even more shy. They retreat to their secret places. The placid days of Indian summer are now displaced by threatening snow and waning light. The summer birds are gone. Mature bulls continue the lonely search for a mate. The caribou accept the return of winter calmly, as does the red fox, who will remain here all winter. But the main herd of caribou will soon make their way south. The red fox is persistent, whether searching for a mouse or a louse. The winter landscape appears to offer little in the way of food. But beneath the snow, still active, are the voles and lemmings on which he feeds. So the raven focuses his attention on the foxes, now that the bears are hibernating, hoping a fox will find something he can scavenge. It'll be a difficult time for the raven. Food is not easy for the fox to find either, and when opportunity knocks, he jumps at the chance. Small bands of caribou begin their southward movement. It's a movement that will grow in size and intensity and continue for several weeks. It'll take the caribou to forest regions further south.
once again, we come to the end of a cycle, season following season, and all await the inevitable renewal, the end of the long winter nights, and the reawakening of spring. In this narrow strip of Alaska, a pipeline and animals. <laughs>